It's time to start our international session. The role of scientific community in disaster response. Lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, bonjour, konnichiwa, everybody in the world. I am Miyoko Watanabe, a facilitator of this session. Thank you very much for coming this, to this session. We invite speakers from seven countries in this session today. So I expect we can have discussion from global perspective. First of all, I would like to introduce the purpose and background of this session. We have the COVID-19 pandemic now in the world and our societies are in the chaotic mess, almost. The number of the infected people has settled down for a while once, but it is increasing now again. The COVID-19 continue, continues to be a major threat in the world. Science has contributed so much to this threat by providing scientific evidence. But we have questions. How have scientists been involved, actually? Was it enough? An interview with Richard Houghton, editor-in-chief of medical journal The Lancet, showed some important points. Raising an early issue regarding a pandemic response. One issue he pointed out is international collaborations. This pandemic is a common issue in the world, so that we can solve this problem with international collaborations. We need data sharing or open science at the world level. The other point he said is we cannot rely only on blockchain. The blockchain has been reported to be very popular very soon in the United States. But blockchain cannot be a magic bullet soon in the world. We have to seek some other resolution to settle it down. Keeping our society healthy economically and emotionally for people. Science can contribute to these issues so much, including economics, historiography, and philosophy. I hope also the government need to understand what scientists say and take it as their actions. If we take this in the big pictures, we can see the COVID-19 as a part of a social crisis, including a natural disasters. In Japan, we had a big earthquake, 3-11, almost 10 years ago. The system created by the reconstruction of 3-11 is now useful for infectious disease control. Asia is a region with many past such experiences and disasters such as earthquakes and tsunami. Similar dis disasters happen around the world. It is a good timing to have discussion on science for society and international cooperation for global crisis response. Today, we invite four panelists and four commentators from Europe, Africa, the United States, Asia, and from Japan. So I would like to go to the speech sessions. The first speaker is Mr. Dan Dutour. He was appointed as Deputy Director General 
responsible for the portfolio international cooperation and resources in South Africa in 2004. Over the years, he has contributed to South Africa's diverse and prosperous international partnership initiative for SDI. Dan, could you start your presentation? Dan, can you hear me? Could you check your mic mute? Can you hear me now? Okay, yeah. Please start. Okay. Yes, good morning and good afternoon and good evening to everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, our deep appreciation to JST and the organizers of the Science Agora for inviting South Africa to participate in this session. Uh, we have a long-standing, much appreciated science partnership with Japan, and one of the highlights of that collaboration is our relationships with JST and Agora, which we've always valued as one of the world's leading platforms for interrogating the role science should play in society and promoting that role. So at this critical time, when our, our world is faced with this, in many instances, your unique uh, global challenge, which is COVID-19, and as you said, Minyoko, we need international cooperation, the sharing of experience and expertise more than ever. We welcome this opportunity with the distinguished colleagues from different regions and different countries to discuss on, on, on what we can learn on how best to mobilize and harness the capabilities of science, our respective scientific communities, to not only um, respond to pandemics such as COVID-19, but, but also to prepare for future uh, pandemics. So I just um, want to start by um, just setting the scene very briefly. I mean, South Africa has been, in terms of absolute figures, the African country hardest hit by the pandemic. As I speak to you, out of a population of 58 million, we've had more than 700,000 cases. Most, of course, we've been fortunate to have seen recovery and a death rate of just over, two, over 20,000. Currently, uh, after a, a very, very strict measures imposed by, by our government, uh, we've had a hard lockdown for some time. Um, the, the, the figures are evolving in a positive way, but as our president emphasized in his address to the nation just last week, and as experience has shown elsewhere in the world, we have to remain vigilant. Um, there are still many, many uncertainties ahead of us. But I think perhaps the, the point to emphasize that other than the impact on public health and the very tragic loss of human health across the world, in South Africa, like elsewhere, the socioeconomic impact has also been devastating. As a country, we, we have continued to grapple with what we refer to as our triple challenge of poverty, unemployment, and inequality. And of course, the impact of COVID-19 uh, which has significantly adversely affected our economic growth, will only make that worse, to put it bluntly. We are currently struggling with unemployment figures uh, of uh, close to 30%, and within this env in the economic environment, it will be very difficult to, to create a type of economic growth to create new op employment opportunities. And I think that's, the, that's a very important point I wanted to, to emphasize at the outset, that when we look at natural disasters, whether public health whether the environment, we have to see them within this socioeconomic context. And also the science response must be contextualized in that socioeconomic context. In terms of added disasters, because you, you had asked that we don't only reflect on COVID-19, uh, South Africa, like many, many African countries, we, we experience climate change on a day-to-day -day basis as a reality. Uh, currently, many parts of our country are suffering severe droughts, which will have impact on our ability to ensure food security or, of course, flooding, flooding as well. And then, then also, as a country where, where the mining sector is very important, we often have to deal with seismic incidents. So the context in, in, in how we respond to disaster management is that we have national legislation, which has been in existence for some time, a dedicated National Disaster Management Act which has been very useful in responding to COVID-19. And that, that, that legislation also allows and draws on the best scientific advice possible. And we think that's very important to ensure that you have that institutional framework. And that is all coordinated by National uh, Disaster Management Center, which has been in existence for, for some time. So 
in South Africa, science has really, like elsewhere in the world, been at the heart of the COVID-19 response. Right at the outset, our president assembled around him what I would like to call the very best of South African science. So these were dedicated advisory mechanisms and structures created, drawing on scientific expertise from all disciplines, not only in, from the infectious diseases, to ensure that our government can draw on the best scientific uh, advice possible to advise, inform our policy and, 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 and decision making. Um, it was not only the advice, but also the, the other capacities existing within the science system, in specifically our research infrastructure, such as our National Center for Epidemiological Modeling or Analysis. And we have seen during this time that our investments over many years in dedicated capacity and infrastructure for, da for, for data analysis, including high-speed networks, supercomputing, and data science experts have been uh, extremely useful. So the South African science system, one of our policy objectives have always been that we organize the science system to be well positioned to respond to disasters as they are emerged. So for example, our department, one of the, the, the entities of our department is responsible for maintaining what we call the South African Risk and Vulnerability Atlas. This is a comprehensive set of climate and other data sets which point to those areas of South African society which is vulnerable specifically to, nat to natural disasters. And then our Academy of Science of South Africa has a range of experts groups which are available to advise government um, on, on disasters. Um, and that is complemented by different capabilities which exist, for example, in our South African National Space Agency for geospatial data and, and analysis, and indeed ongoing research. It's very important that these existing capacities, including the institutional and legislative frameworks, continue to be the subject of critical research and analysis. And at one of our leading research universities, the Northwest University, we, for example, have a dedicated African Disaster Research Center, whose focus is critical academic analysis on how we should prepare and respond to um, uh, disasters. So then to conclude, just to share with you from a science ministry a government perspective. What are some of the lessons I could say we have taken from this time on how our science community has responded to COVID-19? Um, well, first of all, I wanted to say that this has been almost at perversely in the light of a huge public crisis, pandemic and economic consequences, a good time for science in the public eye. We have never before had so much attention from the general public on science with our leading scientists often appearing in mainstream media, et cetera. So that has created a very much an opportunity for us to emphasize and very much like the science of and JST is doing the, the, the importance of, of, of science, science in society. And then the, the second generic comment I would make is that we are still learning. So it's perhaps even too early to draw definitive conclusions because this crisis pandemic is evolving. We've had very positive signs about news about vaccine development, but of course, till the time since, since that vaccine becomes available, specifically in developing countries in Africa, in an equitable and affordable manner, which will make a difference, there's still a lot which 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 must happen. So we're very much still in the learning, in the in the learning mode. I think what has been very important for us is to to it has highlighted the ability or the need to continue to draw on our existing experiences. South Africa has carried a massive disease burden in infectious diseases, notably HIV, AIDS, and tuberculosis for many years now. And that experience in successfully managing those diseases have been very important. We've drawn on those experts to inform our response to COVID-19. Like in most things, the data is absolutely key. And our ability to collect, analyze, and then develop policy advisory products as, um, is a critical investment area. I mean, COVID-19 has, has demonstrated that, that we, we very early were tasked by our president to create a national COVID-19 data response center at our Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. And I think one of the lessons here has been very clear to us that we need to en enhance this data um, cap capabilities. Uh, I think most, most another generic lesson is that we have been able to draw on the success of science investments we've made over many years in all range of disciplines. And that 
rather science capabilities. And that capabilities, we were able to mobilize to respond in a very agile and dynamic manner to the challenges of COVID-19. And that we have to continue to do. So just to give you an example, I mean, the, all the data science investments we did for astronomy has proved very useful in supporting our modeling capability uh, for COVID-19. At a very practical level, some of our engineers in our aerospace program were responsible for our national ventilator development program. So, so that, that, that was almost a vindication of the, the merit of investing in scientific in excellence in, engin in engineering uh, excellence. So um, that we continue then have to harness the best of scientific advice to improve our preparedness and management system. I'm sure countries all across the world will have to have these lessons. Um, and then in terms of management in scientific advice, also coordination between different tiers of government. So in South Africa, we have a national government, we have provincial government, and we have to have local government, and you need to have a coordinated response. But also the scientific advice, which feeds into those different levels of government, because they sometimes have different advisory systems, have to be coordinated and to be, uh, to, to, to be aligned. International cooperation is absolutely crucial. I mean, you said that, um, Minyoko, it's about the sharing of experience and expertise, of data, about access to research infrastructure, about making joint, joint, joint investments. And this time has really proven that. I mean, South Africa currently chairs the African Union. And, and for our president, it was very important to lead and ensure that African co co coordination. Very important, and we'll talk about this later, is communication with the public. Uh, including through through mainstream media. I mean, as I've said, this was a time where science was very visible in the public eye, uh, and that the, the public wanted to trust and believe in the science. But of course, science is also uncertain because we keep on learning. So, so that 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 communication in order to maintain the public trust and confidence also needed to ensure that 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 the, the very nature of the scientific ex enterprise kept on being explained to the public that scientists don't know always everything. And sometimes we, we need to change our views that some things work and, 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 and that don't work. And of course, that's difficult for the public, which which wants certainty. Um, I've said before that the social science has been absolutely critical. Our National Human Sciences um, Research Council had been tasked with co and continues to do comprehensive understandings and survey, uh, uh, analysis and surveys to understand our public's reaction and our understanding of COVID-19. Because as a government, we'll only be able to implement effective policies and response strategies if that is informed by a social science-based understanding of how society will react to these interventions. And we have to include all dimensions and very specifically gender, the gender dimension. Um, South Africa is um, uh, carries a, a burden of what we're not, uh, not proud of at all, of significant incidences, for example, of gender-based violence, the the whole so, um, imp implementation of COVID-19 response measures increased that impact of, of gender-based violence. So these are all the societal aspects which we need our social scientists to inform our government on how to shape uh, response strategies. And I think that's the, the last concluding point is that we have to draw the best scientific advice possible from all disciplines, but that ad advice should also be underpinned by the values. Uh, in the South African context, that would be the values which espouses our constitution, specifically so solidarity and ensuring social justice. We cannot exclude that domain from the science response. And then on a, on a lighter note, um, just to, to emphasize that it's really all about stronger together. About a year ago, South Africa was, uh, we were proud to be crowned in Japan, world champions in rugby. And the motto for our campaign our com was for our team was that we are stronger together. And I, and I think uh, to start to end where I started, that's why we welcomed the organization of this session, because for our world to defeat COVID-19 and other challenges, we need to be united because we can be stronger together. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Dan. You clearly showed uh, what is important for COVID-19 response, or uh, data, international cooperation, public communication, social science, and gender dimensions are crucial for this crisis. Thank you very much. So next, uh, the second speaker is Mr. Koji Saeki, next to me. Uh, he is a senior vice president of JST since July last year. 
He is in charge of almost all of the important issues and programs at JST. He is also responsible for this science agora now. So please start your presentation. Thank you very much for your, for your kind introduction. Good evening, good morning, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kosaiki, and uh, well, first of all, let me express my heartfelt gratitude to excellent speakers from around the world for joining in this uh, session today. I also would like to uh, thank all the people online for your participation. Before starting my talk, I would like to express my sincere condolences to those who have passed away and sympathy for those who are still suffering from the effects of the pandemic. In my presentation, I would like to talk about three, these three points. My talk is based on lessons learned from JST activities concerning past disasters and COVID-19 pandemic. But it is individual opinion and not always represent the official view of JST. First, I would like to touch upon the impact of COVID-19. There is no sign, still no sign of the end of the pandemic and Japan is now considered to be in the midst of the third wave. However, the impact of COVID-19 has still remained relatively small in Asia, uh, including Japan, until now. As to Japan, the US diplomatic journal Foreign Policy described the relatively quiet situation as a mysterious success. Since the government has not enforced mandatory policies. Central and, central and local governments have only requested certain measures to company, shops, general publics, and so on. Several factors have been pointed out while not confirmed yet. For example, smaller number of PCR tests, differences in virus strains, genetic background, Japan's culture of strong hygiene awareness, the law of policy, and the well-established healthcare system, and so on. More detailed <coughs> analysis is needed to decide what kind of factors really played in important roles to realize Japan's situation. Now, I'd like to move to the next topics. STI and SR's role and justice effort. We at JST are now working together with the researchers to overcome this crisis. This is a draft chart of necessary science and technology elements prepared by Center for R&D Strategy in JST. There are multiple categories and groups about urgent tasks. There is no question that we need development of vaccines, drugs, and other medical technologies to deal with COVID-19. This is a part of the uh, chart, and the another funding agency, AMED, is responsible for that. However, it is also important to accelerate R&D to maintain safe and secure social and economic activities in the society with COVID-19, which we call Plan B. The key words are detect, clean, and protect. JST will support such R&D initiatives by providing prompt funding through various schemes. As to the effective funding to fight such a crisis as COVID-19, we have learned through the past disaster, especially the Great East Japan earthquakes in 2011. The situation was really severe at that time, and JST initiated a new program called JRAPID, aiming at promotion of international joint researches on problems caused by the disaster. And during the time of disaster, we can benefit from the capabilities and experiences of other countries through international cooperation. In the case of global crisis, we can work together 
combining our expertise, sometimes complementing each other. Joint, ac joint activities were conducted un under this funding with Thailand, Philippines, Nepal, and Indonesia, uh, as stated in, in the right-hand side. JST has activated the program this time for research contributing to COVID-19 countermeasures. Also, JST is providing urgent support for researchers, researches related to, co to the COVID-19 pandemic by launching flash calls and our flagship basic research programs. Also, the uh, science and technology and innovation can play an important role for the uh, recovery from a disaster. JC has supported the construction of regional industry and revitalization of the economy through industry academic collaboration program. Now I'd like to move to the third part, ensuring the well-being of humankind. I would like to stress the importance of the concept science for global well-being, the first pillar of the declaration adopted at the World Science Forum in October 2019. Now, when the survival of human society is at risk, it is necessary to promote science and technology for people's well-being. In addition, we must not forget that no one will be left behind pillar of the SDGs. For those purposes, I suppose three policy directions are, are important. To assist people to choose the appropriate actions and behavior, we should use science and technology to empower citizens. And maybe it is a good way to avoid totalitarian, totalitarian regime with full of surveillance. And we should review our social system and change that into more resilient one. That is quite there. The uh, social uh, researchers in social sciences really uh, play an important role, as uh, Dan pointed out. Also, oh, against a crisis like COVID-19, we really need international collaboration leading to global solidarity. As, so that, so as to that, uh, the prompt and uh, open provision, provision of convergent knowledge of the crisis is very important. This can establish the trust between citizens, polic polic policy makers, and scientists, and can encourage people's decision and behavior changes. Also as to the trust, I'd like to point out three principles we should bear in mind. One is transparency, and uh, second is fairness, and third is inclusive. Those kind of attitude may lead to more deep trust among the more deep trust among the uh, stakeholders. As to that, I'd like to uh, show you a um, good case, a good example done by the high school students. And just after the uh, uh, earthquake in 2011, the Fukushima, uh, because of the nuclear accident, uh, it suffered from reputational damages. With technical support of GST, the those uh, high school students checked actual radiation level in various areas in Fukushima. And they compared it with other uh, co uh, colleagues around, the, around Japan and around the world. They showed that there was no significant differences in radiation levels compared to other areas based on the scientific evidence. So uh, this is just one, one uh, example. But uh, uh, to collaborate each, collab to collaborate among uh, uh, various people, especially general public. Uh, we can uh, foster the trust among uh, us and lead to a uh, more resilient society against this kind of uh, pandemic or natural disasters. Okay. Thank you for your attention. 
Thank you very much, Saki-san. Oh, you showed a concrete plan of science and technology that is just its uh, plan B. It is a different contribution from medical science. And you also mentioned trust is quite important to change our society and for uh, COVID-19 response. Thank you very much. So next speaker is Dr. Jemira Mahmoud. She is a special advisor to the Prime Minister of Malaysia on public health. She began her mandate in April this year. She is also a member of the Government of Malaysia's Economic Action Council and is actively engaged in the COVID-19 response. Jemia, please start your speech within 10 minutes. Please. Konnichiwa. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be invited to share some of our experiences from Malaysia. And congratulations to Science Agora 2020 for bringing together such esteemed speakers. I've really enjoyed listening to the two previous speakers, uh, and there's not very much that I want to add to that, but maybe share the Malaysian perspective of things. Uh, Malaysia is one of those countries that does not fortunately suffer from earthquakes, but we are feeling the brunt of climate change and uh, flooding is one of the uh, biggest problems we have in the country. So COVID-19 came to us uh, late last year in December, but only manifested in uh, larger numbers around March. And the whole scientific com community, particularly the health community, has really led the response. You know, all the things that were said earlier about trust being such an important factor in the management of a pandemic, and that it's people and their behaviours that will determine the outcome of this pandemic, is I just want to overemphasize that. As the Ministry of Health came together, we had the benefit of previous experiences of SARS, MERS, CoV, H1N1, and therefore we didn't start from scratch. And this is where I think the science community is a learning community. And I completely agree with the first speaker, uh, Mr. Dan de Trois, that you know we are, we have to be humble that there's not everything that we know, and there are things we know that change very quickly overnight with COVID nineteen. So one of the things that we did was to ensure that there would be faces of trust. And just as mentioned by our South African speaker, it was to identify someone who was uh, would build trust quickly with the public. And this was the Director General of Health. And he would come onto the television every day at 5 p.m. with millions, literally half the population of Malaysia, glued to the television to listen to the data. And to build that trust, data has to be um, verified and it has to be transparent. And therefore, this uh, Director General shared data on a daily basis, the number of cases, number of tests, and all the other data that's important. Public health measures are extremely important in managing a pandemic. And simple messaging, the simplicity of manage, uh, messaging is also very crucial. For countries like Japan, social discipline is very high and it's very much easier to try to send messages on physical distancing, wearing a mask. But you and I know at the end of the day, social behaviours alter the way we, we take these messages. And, you know, you have congregations, uh, social activities that just throw everything out the window. So I think this has been the crux of how we've uh, dealt with this. Added to that, of course, is bringing the other scientific communities around the table, those from the Academy of Professors, those from um, National Institutes of Health, behavioural scientists, uh, to really look at how we use their expertise to augment uh, the, the response and the recovery. Uh, technology has played a major role uh, in this pandemic and our Ministry of Science and Technology together with our National Security, uh, Ministry of Health 
uh, has really come together to build, you know, applications where tracking, tracing uh, is very, very crucial in the management. And right now what we're doing is building in behavioral risk assessments into even those applications so that anyone using it will be able to sit, will calculate their own personal risk when they go out of the house or when they do a certain activity or when they go to a certain location. So I will reiterate that it is a learning process. The other thing I want to emphasize is that the pandemic is not just a health crisis. It's a health crisis, it's a humanitarian crisis, it's a development crisis, it's a financial crisis. And and therefore, you know, bringing in the economic um, ministries, the economic advisors, the science, uh, sorry, the um, uh, economists, the actuaries, the financial experts to look at solutions for this. And one of the things that has come out of this is really looking at innovative financing mechanisms that will actually support the recovery uh, from the pandemic. We now know that a uh, vaccine is close uh, to being produced. Uh, we are still looking for the hard data on its safety. I think that it's very strange how um, I, two things I learned from the vaccine experience. One is that when scientists collaborate, you get results fast. And I think this has been a very important learning. Uh, it's international cooperation. It's big pharma cooperating and therefore being able to shorten the time to produce a vaccine from its normal 10 years to about one year and a bit. So science, collaboration is very, very important. But the second thing I learned is that pharma now tells you of their success on media and not through the research. And this is quite alarming because we as scientists have not read the results of the phase three, but the world at large has heard that it's 90% or 95% effective. And I think this is where marketing comes before science. And it's a reality that we have to accept in this day and age. The other thing that I would say is that one of the areas I am really struggling in my country, at least, to get much more research and much more action on is mental health. Um, mental health in many countries like mine uh, is still quite stigmatized. And we're really pushing the mental health experts now to really come up with the data, with the evidence and to guide, you know, the ministries of health as well as the public on dealing with this mental health crisis, which I think is we're just scratching the surface. And I the international cooperation in this is very, very high. I also want to say, I, I mentioned earlier that we have a flooding risk and we're actually entering into our flood uh, season right now yeah, as the rains get very heavy towards the end of the year. And now we need the, the people who manage these natural hazards leading to disasters to work with health experts to figure out how will you manage the, the, the placement of people who are displaced from the floods and not putting them at greater risk of COVID-19 transmission. So it requires requires a completely different paradigm in looking at the problem and really finding a holistic solution to it all. So I think in, in summary, I would say that COVID-19 has been a big eye opener for us. And for many years, let's be honest, that many different um, actors work in silos, whether you're a humanitarian or someone in disaster risk reduction or in uh, climate change adaptation or in health, you know, everyone works in their own silos. And this has been a real eye opener that we need to start looking at things in a bigger picture, how the different aspects of science connect and how in connecting we actually find solutions that are not just fast, but also robust. They are sustainable and they are interoperable. So I want to thank um, uh, the Japanese uh, government for organizing this. And I want to call upon all of you to, you know, let's work together. Let's share these experiences. Let's connect uh, and let's learn from each other. And, uh, and thank you once again. Thank you, Jamira. I hope we keep our connection more. And anyway, you gave us a good suggestion as advisor to the prime minister. Uh, you showed hint of how to obtain trust from government, uh, from government and public. And you said uh, international collaboration is crucial. 
to obtain the trust. Thank you very much. So last presenter is Dr. Anne Cambon Thompson. She is a French med uh, medical doctor specialized in human immunogenetics and health ethics. She is now Emeritus Research Director at French National Center for Scientific Research. She is also Ambassador of the Research Data Alliance, RDA, for health science and research ethics. Um, please start your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, hello to all and uh, thank you very much for allowing me to, to come in this uh, panel and share some of the experience uh, uh, from this COVID-19 crisis. I will have three points. Uh, one at the national level, uh, France is my country, uh, one at the European level and one at the international uh, aspects of this uh, uh, of facing this COVID crisis. The first thing is France, seven, 67 million uh, inhabitants is heavily uh, hit and is currently in the second wave, which is uh, a serious one. So we have um, in total, we have had uh, uh, 46, uh, 7,000 deaths due to COVID-19 and 68% uh, being in hospitals. Um, we, uh, I don't want to, to give too many numbers, uh, it's just serious as other countries in Europe, like uh, Belgium, uh, Italy, uh, Spain, uh, UK, for example. Uh, we actually had um, two periods of lockdown. One is still going on. One was in uh, of around uh, nearly two months in 55 five days precisely in March, from mid-March to uh, 11th of May. And then a period of, uh, well, different measures. And the second wave started in September and uh, was at its peak uh, in November. So we actually are in lockdown until um, 1st of December, but the modalities have evolved. So between the first spring lockdown and the autumn one, there has been lessons learned and uh, consequences of lockdown taken into account. And I was thinking of uh, children, for example, not being at school in spring and being at school now. So the priority to education, for example. Uh, we uh, have had in France the nomination of two science advice mechanism committees ad hoc for COVID-19. One is a scientific committee that helps uh, managing the crisis on a day-by-day -day basis, I would say. And uh, the, it was created the 11th of March and is still very active, uh, has produced a number of uh, notes and opinions, uh, about 30, uh, on different questions. The other thing, the other committee is called CARE. It's a committee for the analysis, research and expertise. And it's more uh, oriented on uh, the orientation and the advice for science, for research uh, uh, in, uh, in this uh, period. It was created the 24th of March. So in, within two weeks, there have been two new specific committees that, of course, do not uh, uh, replace the existing mechanisms, but show how important was uh, this uh, aspect of science advice. Now I would like to come to the uh, second point of uh, my uh, this short talk, uh, which is at the European level. I am a member of the European Group on Ethics of Science and New Technologies that advise for ethical aspects um, to be taken into account in uh, European Union policies, advice to the European Commission. And there is also a science advice mechanism uh, constituted by a group of um, a dozen uh, of scientists of different disciplines uh, that are chief scientific advisors to the European Commission. These two groups work sometimes on 
uh, related uh, topics. But in this uh, crisis, the European Group on Ethics, in the middle of another opinion, which was on, which is still going on on uh, gene, genome editing, um, made a statement uh, on European solidarity and protection of fundamental rights. So the values that were um, underlined by the previous speakers uh, were uh, brought to the forefront through this statement. And uh, that was in early April. In June, recently in November, and one, another one is planned uh, in 2021, the uh, scientific advisors and the European Group on Ethics, together with the special advisor to the um, um, president of the European Commission, work together uh, in, on topics related to COVID-19. And uh, the statement uh, that appeared in June is on scientific advice to European policymakers during the COVID-19 um, crisis also showing the lessons learned on this aspect of science advice and the values behind the science advice. The recent uh, November uh, opinion uh, is actually on um, improving, so turned to the future, uh, improving pandemic preparedness and management at the European level. Because we saw in the first phases of the uh, crisis that um, to react as Europeans, not only as countries, um, was maybe not on its um, best organization for this health crisis. So there are a number of uh, both fundamental values and um, uh, lessons learned and recommendation on this topic. And the third aspect that will be worked on uh, now and in the beginning of uh, 2021 is actually how to be more resilient in future crises, uh, be they uh, epidemies or other kind of, of uh, crisis. So this is just to show that at European level, there has been this, for the first time, uh, work together between science advice and ethical uh, committee. The third point and, uh, of my uh, talk is uh, at international level. You heard that uh, I am um, an ambassador of the Research Data Alliance, which is an international uh, organization that started uh, in 2013, so not too um, ancient. Uh, and um, uh, the European Commission, among other, uh, asked in uh, mid-March uh, this organization to set up a working group to uh, advise both policymakers and researchers on the ground and um, data managers uh, on the data sharing in time of pandemic and specifically this COVID-19 pandemic. So I was one of the co-chairs of this uh, group, and which is still uh, working uh, on some aspects. And in less than a week, 600, more than 600 people from all over the world, different countries, uh, Europe, um, Asia, uh, Africa, and uh, America. Um, and also we had uh, people from Australia, um, came together and uh, to help with this, using their expertise to set up or make more visible standards in different ways. And the topic I want to underline is this interdisciplinarity, because the pandemic, and the previous speakers uh, have um, said it, has many aspects, the health, the care, the epidemiology, there was also a group corresponding to social science. And then in uh, cross-cutting themes, uh, had specific groups uh, working on like uh, the ethical and legal uh, aspect, which are so important in sharing data um, across uh, frontiers. Uh, uh, equally, um, a group worked on software, because it's not only data, it's software 
to manage the data that are needed to be shared. So I, I don't want to uh, take too long. The, the document uh, has been produced uh, within uh, two months or two months and a half. Uh, there was five releases of a document which was finalized uh, and uh, endorsed by the research data organization and made um, completely public and disseminated the 30th of June. So from end of March to end of June, there was an incredible work of all these people. Uh, I've never um, seen so many group meetings, such uh, an efficient coordination. So in itself, this is an experience which from the people in our uh, was very special at the time of this COVID-19. And using all these different expertise cross-disciplinary uh, to help uh, making recommendations for policymakers and for uh, researchers in practice, how to share uh, and what to refer as uh, standards and uh, where to find the rules uh, and so on, um, to share data efficiently. I think this is a sort of milestone um, at this International of Science uh, mobilization. Uh, so that's um, the three points I wanted to make. Uh, and of course, uh, I can um, intervene in the discussion on uh, the points you uh, would like to. Thank you very much again for this opportunity. And hello from France. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, you experienced a severe uh, pandemic in France, and you show the concrete action of European science uh, science community, and that is what we have to know. And you said uh, data sharing in time, that is very important. Thank you very much. So we uh, had a presentation from four panelists. They showed some common suggestion for COVID-19 response. The first is, we need international collaboration, including data sharing. The second is the pandemic is one of the disaster, like climate change induced natural disaster. And the third is we need trust to, to respond to COVID-19 and the social crisis. So here, let me share the figures showing the current COVID-19 number of the infected people and deaths in countries of uh, speakers in these sessions. The numbers uh, shows each case of uh, one million population. As you know, the U.S., Europe and South Africa shows a higher number, and Asia shows lower numbers. Uganda also shows very small numbers. The situation strongly depends on the area and the country. So we have uh, common issues and local issues, both. So I'd like to take comment on these suggestions from four commentators from various countries. The first is Dr. Kony Ushimari Lui. Uh, Kony, I'm sorry, I cannot pro pronounce your family name. Anyway, she's an immediate past co chair of the Global Young Academy. She's an independent science and policy facilitator and actor at the Science Policy Interface as a science uh, writer, uh, trainer, and speaker. She's also current Secretary General of the Uganda National Young Academy. She can talk why Uganda uh, shows a small number of infections and deaths. Anyway, she's a representative of younger people and African po uh, people. Connie, please uh, start your comment. <coughs> yes. Good, uh, good evening over there in Japan. Uh, it's uh, just afternoon here. I'm happy to be to be here, and thanks a lot for the for the invitation. It has been very interesting, as you say, uh, to listen to how the pandemic has affected the different regions of the world, and of course, we see it here, listening to the news. And uh, it must be said that I do see some similarities with my own country. 
Uh, with that said, as you, you correctly said, the nature of the pandemic as experienced by the Ugandan public differs from, from everyone who has spoken. <clears throat> uh, we, we actually reported our first death in, towards the end of July, so months and months after the pandemic was already raging around the world. And four months later, we are only at around just under 160 deaths. So, I mean, there are days that we don't record any death at all still. And some, I mean, it's certainly possible that part of what we observe is, is just a, a poor data collection. Um, but uh, it's, it, it's similar to what happened, has happened in other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, my reading so far has not uh, really brought a very strong reason why this is the case. So this is still a, a case uh, for, for research. And maybe some of the panelists know something that I don't because uh, after all, I'm not a COVID expert. But uh, what this has uh, created anyway for us is that there's been a, a relaxation of vigilance because we had something like a three or four month lockdown where we were very vigilant and we were observing social distance. And I, this was, 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 was very strong, but now, when you go around the cities, people are just walking around without masks in, in very uh, crowded areas. So the vigilance has, 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 has dropped. <clears throat> and uh, with regard to communication, uh, national science communication, this is, as it was said for South Africa, largely through the president. So the president uh, holds these public addresses every so often, and he has taken a very big lead in, in communicating with the public. Uh, apparently, informed by a team of scientists. Uh, the only difference with South Africa, for instance, is that this team of scientists is largely from the medical sciences. So hardly any social sciences enters that uh, equation. So the, the social and economic effects have only been realized after the lockdown has, has ended. And I must say that even then, uh, when you look at the research funding that's being uh, released, even then social and economic issues are, are still very low on the radar. So I don't really see planning for resilience or wider thinking about the epidemic beyond how is the disease spreading, how can we track it better, and these kind of things. And again, maybe that's well, that's just how it is here in Uganda. Perhaps it's, it's we, we are not so we don't have such a strong interdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary research culture yet. And um, as with Malaysia, there is also a big concern over mental health. We have seen more and more public displays of people setting themselves on fire. Certainly, domestic violence has, has, has spiked, a lot of teenage pregnancies. So a lot of social issues are being observed, but you don't see a lot of focus on it in the, in the science communication to the public. And uh, peculiar about Uganda is also that we are in the months preceding our parliamentary and presidential elections. So unfortunately, the pandemic control has become a little bit politicized. If some of you have seen in the news in the last two days, the main opposition candidate has been locked up because he apparently held a rally with the number of people more than what is allowed. Although the, the ruling party holds as big a rally as they like and nothing happens. But uh, the riots also could be a response, just a, a frustration of the economic and social effects of, of this pandemic because uh, the, in the cities there's a lot of informal economic activity and this has faced a lot of strain during the lockdown which was three or four months long and this still hasn't uh, recovered. So in, in summary I'll just say that uh, the direct communication between scientists and the public has been very low and, uh, and the main communication is still through the, the health ministry machinery and it doesn't seem that we are making any steps towards doing research into how we can become more resilient as a society. And it could be that we already feel quite resilient because you may know that Ebola is something that we've been, we've fought several times over the last so many years. And it could be that we already feel fairly 
resistance, resist, resilient. So the, the coronavirus or the COVID-19 pandemic appears to be quite low on the lo long list of troubles that, troubles that we have as a, as, a, as a society. And instead government now faces pressure to reopen schools, to, ar to allow churches to reopen. And uh, the scientific advice really doesn't play a big role in, in, in those decisions. That's what I would say. Thank you, Connie. Uh, one reason why uh, the number of the uh, infected people in Ghana is the pandemic started late, so we should know the each local conditions. And uh, you are aware of a social problem induced by COVID-19, and you are contributing uh, with uh, sense communication with the public and uh, many people. Thank you very much. So next, uh, I'd like to ask uh, the comment to Professor David uh, Boots Pedersen. He is a professor of science communication and the director of the Human Nomics Research Center at Olbo University in Copenhagen. He will join Kyoto University International Advisory Board for the L Insight Global Ex Excellence Program from next year. So maybe uh, we can see uh, next year. So, uh, David, please start your comment. Thank you. Thank you so much, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. And uh, I would also like to start expressing my gratitude for, uh, to the JST and Science Agora for organizing this international panel. It's already been a pleasure and very inspirational to listen to colleagues from around the world uh, who are definitely doing a huge difference in uh, coming up with a, a resilient um, response to the, to the current pandemic, which we are all facing. I really believe that the, the pandemic we're witnessing is, a, is, is such a cross-cutting uh, event that all disciplines and across all silos, may they be uh, civil society, policy making or science, needs to come together and, and work together. And I think this has been stressed throughout the, the session. So I'm going to speak a little bit to you from the point of view of being an exotic uh, social scientist who actually uh, does research on the COVID-19 science advice response. So I've been looking into how uh, science advisors around Europe with a particular focus on Denmark and the Nordic countries are responding uh, to the current crisis. And uh, I will be speaking a little bit about the need for stressing independent expert advice and evidence. Um, what we have seen from the standpoint of doing research is at least that in the Nordic countries, uh, Scandinavia, governments have been relying very heavily on their internal services and agencies, or as Connie said, the machinery of the health ministry. Uh, Cross-government coordination and integration has been working very well uh, throughout the first wave of the pandemic in the spring, but has turned out to be much more contested uh, and less uh, trustworthy during the second wave. So in the first wave, we saw very little to none uh, party uh, politicization or polarization regarding crisis. There was a large um, degree of consensus across all parties and also across uh, civil society with the compliance rates up to 90% of the population would follow and report following uh, government um, um, recommendations, uh, behavioral recommendations, and would listen to uh, government uh, communication and find it trustworthy. Whereas during the last phase of the pandemic and rapidly actually uh, accelerating during the last couple of weeks only, we have been witnessing an increasing polarization on restrictions such as wearing masks, social distancing, closing of restaurants, closing of businesses. And we do know that such polarization in the opinions and the attitudes towards the uh, uh, pandemic do have effects on compliance. And actually in our data right now, we can see that there is a slight fall in compliance. So the fact that people start doubting what government scientists are saying is really a testimony also to the fact that compliance may go down. So in reality, we have witnessed a system-wide failure of independent science advice. I think we have been too reliant on the government's own advisors that, as many of you will know, are often filtrated uh, through the political system where messages are going to get uh, designed for 
political audience rather from to a scientific one. So there has been a manifest lack of power distance in the Scandinavian countries between science and policy, which has led to this general feeling that policymakers are quite selective in their use of evidence um, and several position statements published by science advisory uh, bodies and panels have actually been neglected. So we have seen uh, uh, advice on recommendations to not closing borders, to not closing public schools. And also we have seen the failure of not acknowledging very early warnings already in the spring of some mutations within our pink population, uh, mink uh, population. Uh, also, at the same time, we have worked continuously uh, to get access to open data, to cross-check uh, the advice coming from government by independent laboratories. And I think some success has been made. So I'll end my, my, my short intervention here to say that in the Scandinavian countries, we have had for now a number of years, but actually culminating in the pandemic, a very high level of trust to both government and scientists. But it is slightly decreasing. And I think exactly transparency, fairness, inclusiveness, and then also uh, openness and independence is some of the keywords that we need to focus more on moving ahead forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. You mentioned the lack of independent expert advice and evidence, or there has been a lack of power distance between science yes. and policy. Oh, and you said uh, several or statement by science advisors has been neglected. It is a shock, but uh, or maybe it's a common issue in the world. We have but Taku and uh, we have to solve this problem, this big gap. Thank you very much. So next commentator is uh, Professor Yasuo Deguchi. You know, he's a vice pro provost and a professor of philosophy, Kyoto University. David will visit next year. He is one of the most successful and popular philosophers in Japan. His theory is very original and based on Asia perspective. A lot of academia and company people are interested in his theory. He will talk from Japanese philosophy perspective. Please start, Degui Sensei. So can I share my slide with you? Yes. Yes, okay, I will do that. Thank you. Um, here is the slide. So my comments are, of course, very, very, very philosophical. Be careful about that. Okay, and uh, let me ask what is the lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic. That is one of the main issues today, is, I think. And I prepare lesson three, okay, three lessons. And here's lesson one, first one, that is incapabilities. So we observe the many levels of sorts of incapabilities, individuals, local communities, government, even science, and health sectors, and human beings, at least in the end. And of course, we should remove it or improve uh, those you know, incapability by many means as possible, and including those you mentioned already. We should do that. But I wonder that there is or remains at least one fundamental incapability for all humans after those old efforts. That is the fact that we cannot live our lives, uh, even one day life, without help, support, or afford, afford or many other agents, such as fellow human beings, non-humans, social infrastructures, uh, institutions, science, and ecosystem, global ecosystem, and geosystem. So as far as some of the observing uh, incapabilities of many levels come from those this fundamental incapability of all humans that is inescapable. That is quite bad news, I'm afraid. But there is a good news, good sign on the another coin, other side of the coin, that is being supported affordedness. Since, as I said, we are fundamentally incapable or weak we should be, and actually is, helped, supported, afforded by those various numerous agents as far as we arrive, as far as our life is continued. 
So being supportedness, affordedness is our nature or given or essence that we cannot get rid of. That's good news. And this is a last a lesson I want to mention today. So global or local cooperation at many or level is not merely an ideal that we should aim at, but a default or starting point or given that we should keep track of and that we should avoid or reduce our derailment from it. So, but Certainly, there are many derailments we are observing globally, locally, from this default cooperation. But I believe that when we observe from the pandemic phenomena, for example, our fundamental incapabilities and basic mutual support, and when we dispel our illusion that we can live our life by us alone, Maybe we can lead to a guide to re-relement to this default cooperation. A cooperation is default. We should restore that. That is a lesson we can learn from Corona pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Or uh, maybe many people are interested in you, what you said because uh, you mentioned we should focus on incapability usually. We talk about the capability of humans, but you said incapability is more important so that we need collaboration, cooperation. So thank you very much. So final uh, commentator is uh, Julia McKenzie uh, in S in the United States. Uh, she is a chief program officer of AAAS. Oh, she was uh, promoted to this position at the beginning of this month. Congratulations, Julia. She is an expert in science policy and global health diplomacy. She is now in the United States at and about 4 o'clock in the morning. It is too early to, for her to join this session. So we got her message for this session. So I need her message for her. AAAS, congrat congratulate JST on Sense Agora. We wish we could be together with you in person, but trust that we will soon be together again. It is more important than ever to ensure that science is serving society. The COVID pandemic has promoted scientific discovery at awesome speed, producing effective vac vaccine against a novel pathogen faster than was ever imagined, and simultaneously has revealed immense challenges at the interface of science, policy, and disaster response implementation. In the in the face of these challenges, our scientists must three things. First is communicate more efficiently, including communicating risk and uncertainty with policymaker, journalists, and directly with the public. Second is strengthen local arrangement, uh, engagement between scientists and uh, communities so that relationship of trust are built in advance of next crisis. In the third way, work to build more robust system of international collaboration in the face of global challenge, such as the emerging disaster and climate change. Uh, the long-standing partner of Science Agora, we wish you a productive meeting and look forward to working together. Best wish you, Julia. Thank you very much, Julia. So we would like to start our discussion, but we only have 15 minutes. So we have to a uh, very fruitful discussion <laughs> for the short time. 
So first discussion is, uh, may maybe we can discuss only for this topic. What is the role of a scientist in scientific advice in crisis and how to work with government? So David told us there has been a big gap between science and policy. And first of all, I would like to ask Jamia, you are a special advisor to the prime minister and the medical doctor. Could you give us a comment about it? Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was listening with a, a lot of uh, interest on uh, uh, Prof. Peterson's uh, comments. Um, you know, my my role is actually I'm a long-standing humanitarian uh, and development actor, and uh, was appointed to this position merely because I, you know, I escaped. COVID in Switzerland came home for a break and uh, and was just hired. Um, so I would disagree because I think in Malaysia at least our perspective is the scientist community is very independent. Um, the Ministry of Health is extremely independent and in fact every day we meet uh, interministerial meetings sometimes chaired by the Prime Minister where the last say will be the scientific community. So politicians take instruction from the scientists which is actually quite, it's, 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 I think it's good because it's really important. My role as advisor is also very, very, um, very interesting because I have a very neutral role where I can actually even check on the government to say, I don't agree with that or I agree. So I think, you know, this is extremely important in managing the pandemic because if you politicize health, then we, we will really get into a lot of trouble. So I think in, in, in trying to, you know, how do you ring fence then scientists to play that neutral role in advising government um, and, and that requires the leadership uh, to actually acknowledge that in a crisis like this you do need uh, evidence-based uh, fact-based decision making and not uh, politicizing uh, the crisis the the one other thing I will say is that in Malaysia we are our, we have massive amount of netizens. We probably have one of the most robust social media countries uh, in the world. And what uh, happens is that um, everything that comes out has to be fact-checked by the, the by the Ministry of uh, Health, because one of the biggest challenges with wanting to have uh, transparency and wanting to have an uh, ability to communicate is an infodemic of also misinformation. So I think you know being able to nip misinformation in the butt very quickly by the scientific community is going to be crucial. And the actual laws when there's misinformation that, uh, you know, people can be charged. So uh, it's important. It has to be independent. We need to protect and ring fence the scientists and the communications has also to be checked all the time. Thank you. Uh, if you have a comment, please raise your hand. Uh, do you have some comment about it? So may I ask Dan, you are working at the government side, so you should know how to <laughs> to, to this question. Could you give us a short comment? Yes, thank you. And I, and I, and I think the, 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 the short comment will actually just be to agree with everything Jamila has just said from a government perspective, because that's the way it should be. Uh, we, we want our scientific community to, without fear or favor, and give us the best advice possible. Uh, that, that's their responsibility. As a government, our responsibility is then to, to make the, the best decisions in the interest of our, of our, of our citizens, drawing on, on all advice and contextualizing them in the, in the socioeconomic uh, reality we have. So it's, 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 it's all about trust, building that relationship of trust and then being, being very clear of the, the respective roles and, and responsibilities and, and avoiding, as Jimena said, the situation where parties antagonize each other uh, um, because it, it's really all about a, a, com a common purpose. Thank you, David. Please. But it but it does take it does take it does take maturity in a system, and that that we should all acknowledge, and 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 it and it is it, and it will always be be work in progress, and and we should not take any of that for granted. So it, it it's a set of relationships which we continuously have to invest in. Thank you, Dan. David, please. 
Yes, no, I appreciate the comments by uh, Jamila and, and Dan. I, I, do, I do myself believe uh, strongly in independent science, science advice. Uh, but it is, uh, it is just, I'm just observing the fact that in the Scandinavian countries, I think for a number of years, we believed we were so good at science advice that we actually mainstreamed all our advisors into government, which makes them part of government and therefore also seen not as the neutral or honest broker that Jamila was speaking about, but more as an vested interest, which is a very um, tricky position to be in. Uh, still, the advice is sound. Still, the government is trustworthy. We have very little uh, degree of corruption, actually none. Uh, we have very high degree of trust in government and normally also high levels of transparency. But I think the role of the independent advisor is extremely important to have, as Jamila also said, to put the government's uh, own communication and conclusions under scrutiny and to get second opinions. It's actually a very valuable resource for democracy and for our societies to be able to access second opinions. And there was a really nice paper put out by uh, my colleagues, uh, Sir Peter Glugman and James Wilson a couple of years back called The Paradox of Science Advice. And it's a little bit, uh, they are, what they are arguing is that if you're too close as an advisor to politics, that might sometimes compromise your independence. If you're too far away from policymaking, you might not really understand how to provide advice in a timely and responsive manner. So we have constantly to negotiate the distance between policy and science. And I think we are all learning how to become better at that. Thank you very much. <coughs> uh, we have, oh, okay, um, please. Just uh, on this point, I think that uh, uh, it has been said by others, um, uh, the underlying uncertainty. And in times of a new disease, a new pandemic, uh, there is a lot of uh, uncertainty. And uh, this leads uh, to um, non-consensus, or at least debate, uh, among scientists. And this has been true for uh, clinical trials, and this has been true for um, uh, different, the, the weight of different uh, factors in uh, the evolution of the pandemics. And um, what I saw in France was debate in the, on the TV, for example, between scientists and the journalists. Uh, that's my own belief, should have a role there, the media, in trying to explain to the public um, why it is important to have uh, these, um, uh, these discrepancies and uh, their basis and that this is normal uh, and that's also part of the trust. Um, but in many cases, what I saw was uh, uh, the um, desire of journalists to have these battles in front of the public because it, it attracts the public, rather than explaining uh, the, the basis of this uncertainty, of these discrepancies, which is difficult. So there, I think that uh, there, are, there is a role of scientists, but there is also the role in the interaction between scientists and media, uh, and specifically uh, uh, in this uh, time and uh, evidence of uncertainty, if I can say so. Okay, Kuni, just a moment. Uh, we have a question from, from the audience. <clears throat> I would like to ask you to answer this question. Uh, do you see any change of uh, activity of scientists and uh, government cooperation after COVID-19 pandemic? Can you answer, Kuni? Yes, of course. Um, I think so. I think so. We've already seen a little more interest in what scientists produce. Although, as I said earlier, many of the scientists only produce war, uh, advice from only one perspective. So they'll only do, you know, the problem from one, one discipline. But yes, I think there will be more reliance or more acknowledgement of the of, of what science can do um, but just to add to that uh, what Dan said about uh, a system being mature is very very important because in our case because the, the communication between government and scientists is, is is not mature then in a crisis ineffective because they, they don't no time to 
to build those uh, communication. And so they rely on their usual uh, system, which is through the line ministry. And then there's not that much uh, research done in the ministries so that in the end we end up acting on, on advice that concerns international situation. So uh, we really had to rely a lot on what internationally is being uh, suggested rather than on, on, on data that is being produced in the country or advice that's being produced in the country. Thank you very much. Degui Sensei, do you have any comment about it? Do you see some change? Uh, okay. But I, I, um, well, no change. Uh, uh, this is related to the, uh, what I mentioned. And okay, science, scientific advice is, of course, uh, evidence-based and fact-based, but that is also, also assumption-based. That is the case, especially for the model and the simulations. In the pandemic, many scientists produced or provided us a simulation for pandemic, and that is based on many, many big assumptions. Some are good, some are unreliable. But still there's a gap between the science know that. So yes, what we have is based on the many assumptions. But that is not the case for the policy or policy makers and general public. Still there's a sort of recognition gap between this aspect of science that I think is still problem remain. Thank you very much, Saiki-san. Do you have any comment? Thank you for the chance for giving me chance for give me a chance to talk about that. Um, the, I think I'd like to uh, point out one another another aspect of the science-based advice and policy making. There's a kind of a conflict between value or, uh, for example, the uh, this is a health crisis. But also, this is financial and this economic crisis. In Japan's case, people could be dead uh, because of the uh, soft, soft uh, control of the uh, uh, contact between among among the uh, general public. But also, if we put on a quite a strict measure, then the economy will become quite a, uh, down, and then. Just in, in, especially in Japan's case, there must be a rise in uh, uh, suicide cases and so on. For example, in August, we have seen the 80% increase uh, suicide among the uh, young female generation. Of course, that is not only because of the economy, but uh, that kind of conflict of the uh, policy decision and consequences occurred. So policy decision making is not only couldn't be uh, based on, on only on the science basis, but uh, there, the, there must be a consideration among the values of um, another, other aspects or influence of the other, act, other uh, consequence because of the uh, decision made, the, the policy decided by the, from the certain aspect. So it's really difficult topics and uh, uh, the the point is uh, important point is as you mentioned the uh, uh, my colleagues mentioned uh, the transparency and the uh, some independence and so on but still there are the limitation of what science advice can do so this is my point thank you very much so I would like to discuss more but I have to close this session very soon. So finally, I would like to conclude this session. Well, everybody in any stakeholder in science community can contribute to the uh, response of the social crisis, including COVID-19. We need our action now, accepting public needs, and key word is collaboration. We need local and international collaboration. That is a uh, essential and crucial. And trust is also crucial in our society. We would like to make more trust between scientists and the government and uh, uh, public people with uh, many stakeholders. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope we will discuss uh, more somewhere in the future. So finally, I would like to appreciate all of the panelists, commentators, 
staffs, they prepared this session very hard. Thank you very much. And all of the participant audience of this session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you.